Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Intiaz. I also go by Taz. Uh, I'm the tech leader for data analytics uh, at AWS, joined here today by my friend and colleague, uh, Harshida Patel, uh, principal analytics uh, specialist SA. Welcome to this session on uh, best practices with uh, AWS analytics and generative AI on AWS. In this session, uh, we will uh, cover several topics, uh, including data analytics and generative AI. And with the help of uh, a demo reference architecture, we will uh, look at how data analytics enables generative AI use cases. We'll also share cost and performance uh, recommendations that you can use for designing data pipeline architectures on AWS. So before we jump in, I would like to begin by taking a moment to appreciate how far data platforms have come along. I've been in the data space for over 20 years now, and I remember back then, uh, for big data, the focus used to be on three Vs, volume, velocity, and variety. Today, we factor up to 10 Vs of data. I also remember back then, I built my first 20-node uh, Hadoop cluster in 2010. It took me three months to get it right. Today, a click of a button here, a checkbox there, you have an entire Hadoop cluster in minutes. Likewise, back then, data pipeline architectures used to be typically simple, right? A set of processes bundled together to move data from source to destination. Over time, this data pipeline, these data architectures have evolved to accommodate the growth of data around us. Operating data warehouses and data lakes has become a common thing for many organizations. Business use cases and data architectures such as Customer 360, uh, Data Mesh, Inventory Management, and uh, with the ev evolution of these data architectures moving quickly, along with deployment models, moving from self-managed to managed to serverless. This is all change and growth. So while change and growth is in inevitable, following a few fundamental principles and best practices can help mitigate the performance and cost impact that usually comes from this change and growth. So let's talk design best practices for an analytics pipeline. Now, we at AWS spend a lot of time with our customers and their solutions, you all, basically. And not surprisingly, a lot of our learnings also come from our customers. This design best practices that you see here is a mind map of an abstraction of these customer learnings and summarizes how AWS customers approach their solution designs. So what makes a design simple? Let's start with ETL. ETL is a key part of a data pipeline, and oftentimes it is also the most complex part. Zero ETL is a low-code, no-code construct for point-to-point -point data movement. It simplifies development and provides integration capabilities out of the box. Amazon Redshift Streaming and Amazon Aurora Zero ETL are some of the capabilities on, Z on AWS today. Another focus area for simplicity is data sharing. The most optimal way to share data is to share it by not making copies of it. It is to share it in place with centralized access controls. Analytics practices such as uh, building data products, federated query, and AWS services such as Amazon Data Zone and AWS Lake Formation simplify data sharing. Next, reliability of a data pipeline is enhanced by its ability to document everything that matters to it. So think of errors, uh, events, not notifications. Lineage provides a way to do your data's chain of custody. Additionally, ensuring compliance and setting in proper retention policies raises the reliability bar of your data pipeline. A reliable data pipeline is also one where you put safeguards in place to prevent your data lake from becoming a data swamp. Ensuring the quality of your data at the time of ingestion can prevent corrupt data from flowing upstream. 
The data quality feature of AWS Glue helps in validating your data during source intake. The scalable feature of your data pipeline is the ability of your pipeline to grow up or down according to your workload demands. Workload capacity demands are better addressed through managed and serverless solutions that can quickly scale infrastructure up or down. Similarly, applications also grow in functionality over time, functionality that may require you to quickly pivot to, let's say, a new programming language or to a newer framework or maybe simply to just upgrade something in existence. Scalability includes investing in tools and services that are scoped and designed to support a future state outlook. And finally, decoupling storage from compute gives you the flexibility to manage the cost of storage and compute separately, as well as removes dependencies when you're optimizing one from the other, especially when the needs for data far exceeds, the growth of rate for need for data far exceeds that, that of compute. And lastly, you add additional flexibility by designing modular pipelines where components can be incrementally added, removed, or swapped. Data pipeline requirements grow over time, and you should be able to move quickly and course correct without fully disrupting the pipeline or having to start from scratch. So, Similar to design best practices, application and service best practices also help, ma help manage cost and performance. Let's look at these through the help of a use case, a generative AI use case, and how data analytics plays a role in it. Now, generative AI, or Gen AI, is a new technology and arguably experimental uh, with many organizations. However, I doubt there's anyone in this room who, in the very least, has not heard about it or has played around with it in some shape or form. So let's level set. What is generative AI? <laughs> very simply, it's the use of artificial intelligence to create new content using AI models trained on large amounts of data. These models, they are called foundation models, which use unsupervised machine learning. And by unsupervised, what it means, it's a process of analyzing unlabeled data, which is data which doesn't really have any classifications or any categorization. LLMs, or large language models, are a type of foundation model used for text and language-based use cases. And we are seeing very creative uses of Gen AI, uses including intelligent chatbot, uh, conversational chatbots, uh, generating programming uh, code from text, and uh, summarizing long-form narratives such as books and transcripts. Likewise, we are also seeing a trend of popular application building approaches, or, or patterns, if you may, that AWS customers are using to build Gen AI applications. And depending on the pattern or approach, there are grounding capabilities, which is their ability to successfully use information can vary from purpose-built to context-driven and correspondingly influence their adoption experience. You start with training your own model. This is the approach where customers build their own model from the ground up, with, which is pre-trained on very large amounts of domain-specific data. These models are purpose-built for the tasks they are designed to deliver on and are highly grounded. An example of this approach is the Bloomberg GPT LLM built for the finance domain using financial data. The next one, which is the fine-tuning a pre-trained model approach. This is when you take a pre-trained model and train it further on a smaller label data set to customize it to your specific business needs. And the third one, uh, the in-context learning approach, and we'll be talking a little bit more in detail about this one. This is where you do not really alter the model parameters or train the model on any specific data set, but instead, you guide the model, the, you guide the model's behavior by passing it additional context. Context can be semantic context, it can be situational context, it can be both. Think of this as dropping hints. 
Retrieval augmented generation and prompt engineering are two of the most common examples of this kind of approach. So what does this look like? Let's take a look at a representational flow of an in-context learning approach. You start with a user submitting a question or a statement as a prompt, and then keywords are extracted from the prompt and used to retrieve data from enterprise data stores such as uh, data warehouses, uh, data lakes, uh, and a vector database. This additional data is used to augment the original user prompt and submitted to the LLM or to the model. And the model now responds with a much richer and contextually relevant information. Also, besides uh, storing data in transactional data stores, many organizations also uh, collect data in the form of files, images, and documents. This data provides additional relevant context and can be stored as vector embeddings in a vector database. Vector embeddings are uh, essentially uh, a way to convert data into numerical representations that capture their meaning and relationship. The process involves ingesting this data from source and then breaking it down or splitting it into manageable chunks, which is then transformed into a high-dimensional numeric construct and stored in a vector database. The vector database, database measures the distance between two vectors and helps with efficient similarity searches, making them an ideal choice for LLM-based applications. So here's a, a simulation of an in-context learning demo for a Gen AI-based conversational chatbot application. The application helps build a body of work for an employee's promotion. Included in the question prompt, we are providing situational context, as in who the employee is in terms of uh, their tenure, their current role, their desired role, and also we are providing hints on contributions made by this employee. In the response, we are augmenting the prompt with situational context from the company's uh, activity data warehouse, which is a domain data for employee contributions, and semantic context from the company's role dimensions, uh, example promotional documentation, and leadership principles, which is stored in a vector database. The reference architecture, the, the walkthrough for this reference architecture looks something like this. It starts with the user submitting the question as a prompt to the Gen AI application. The application checks conversation state. So this was a conversational chatbot. It checks for conversation state from previous conversations, uh, which is uh, using Amazon DynamoDB, a key value, a NoSQL key value store for additional situational context. The prompt is then applied to a template to build a Redshift SQL query using metadata from the AWS Glue data catalog. A Lambda function is used to query and return the response as context to the Gen AI application. Similarly, parts of the prompt referencing uh, unstructured data, such as role dimensions and leadership principles, are converted into vector embeddings as semantic context to query an Amazon Open Search vector database. All context received from both Redshift and OpenSearch is submitted to the model, to the LLM. And then the model uses the context to build a coherent and meaningful response. The conversation state and history is updated back into the DynamoDB table. And then finally, the model response is returned to the user. So this was the work through from the Gen AI chatbot perspective. Let's look at the data pipelines behind the scenes that are enabling this Gen AI workflow. We used a streaming layer to start ingesting near real-time streaming data from multiple siloed data sources. And we update the conversation state in the DynamoDB table as, as needed. And then the streaming layer also transforms some of the ingested data into an Amazon S3 data lake. The streaming services used here are Amazon Managed Streaming for Apache Kafka or Amazon MSK, Amazon Kinesis Data Streams, 
an Amazon managed service for Apache Flink. MSK is a fully compatible uh, open source Apache Kafka service with uh, uh, ability to run Kafka Connect clusters uh, with replication across multi-regions. Kinesis uh, Data Streams is a real-time streaming service for rapidly moving data off of producers. It's a serverless service and provides short and long-term options for streaming data, for retaining streaming data. The Managed Flink service is also a fully managed service to run Apache Flink applications and supports uh, analysis of streaming data in real time. So let's see how to get the most out of these uh, streaming services. We'll start with uh, Amazon MSK. So when uh, working with uh, a provisioned MSK cluster, give your cluster enough headroom to tolerate uh, operational events such as uh, broker failures. The recommendation there is to maintain a 40% CPU availability baseline. Similarly, to mitigate throttling and downtime issues, consider defining an 80% throughput threshold. With, uh, auto, with storage, plan ahead and use auto sto uh, storage auto scaling feature for dynamic growth. And finally, for right sizing your cluster, calculate the right number of brokers and uh, partitions to meet your throughput availability and latency needs. Now, we are providing uh, QR codes for some of this documentation. We'll again be repeating this uh, towards the end, so if you want to take a picture at the time, that would be great. Moving on, uh, the Kinesis Data Stream Service. So this service is billed at a 25 KB per payload unit. So consider uh, compressing and aggregating your messages to reduce cost. This service also provides consumer and producer libraries, KPL and KCL. So consider leveraging these libraries wherever possible because these libraries abstract away a lot of the operational heavy lifting for you. So for example, the KPL library auto compresses and aggregates. Uh, likewise, the KCL library de-auto aggregates. It also helps with the sharding events and checkpointing. And uh, enhanced fan out consumer, it, this is a feature of the service, uh, a consumer using enhanced fan out gets two MB per second read through, throughput, and you can have multiple uh, uh, consumers reading from the same stream. So the recommendation there is to use enhanced fan out if you have multiple consumers. And then finally, throughput limits can be managed using on-demand and uh, provision modes. Start with on-demand mode and use provision only if on-demand cannot provide the capacity you need. And with, uh, uh, with the managed uh, Flink service, the performance of this service is largely influenced by the application itself. So we start with checkpointing. The recommendation there is to enable checkpointing to provide application fault tolerance. Uh, snapshots, so snapshots are usually created uh, during application stop and are used to restart uh, with the correct state. Now, snapshots is a good practice, but it does impact cost and performance. So the Recommendation there is definitely use it in production, but do, do your due diligence in development environments. And the operator parallelism. Flink operators transform data streams into new data streams and combine those into new data flows. By default, all Flink operators have parallelism set at an application level. This can lead to provisioning issues with upstream uh, sinks and sources which may have a different parallelism aspect. So consider setting your operator parallelism as a function of the application or as a function of the source, depending on your application needs. Coming back to the demo architecture, data stored by the streaming ingestion service is now in the data lake is vectorized and ingested into a vector database supported by the Amazon Open Search service. These uh, vector embeddings are used by the GenAI application to search for semantic context. Now, Open Search is an open source distributed search and analytics platform. It is derived from Elasticsearch. The vector engine feature of this service extends it to provide contextually relevant information and can search across billions of vectors. Uh, Harshida will be covering the provision service in much more detail. For now, let's look at some of the best practices for vector search. 
Open Search supports uh, nearest neighbor algorithms such as HNSW and IVF for searching vectors. Each of these algorithms provides a search mechanism with modalities that impact cost and performance. So the recommendation there is to evaluate and benchmark the algorithm for your use case before making a choice. Vector searches are memory intensive. Consider choosing memory optimized uh, EC2 instances such as the R5 family. For batch indexing, improve the vector indexing performance when batch ingesting large number of vectors by disabling the refresh interval and replicas. Disabling or uh, raising the refresh interval leads to lower number of segments and has a direct impact on performance. Disabling replicas during batch ingestion improves performance as it prevents duplicate construction of native library indexes on both the primary and the replicas. Now keep in mind, loss of a node when replica is disabled can cause data loss. So ensure you maintain a copy of your data for contingencies. And likewise, similar for search performance, uh, for improving your search performance, use the warm-up API to cache your searchable indexes to avoid the initial search latency penalty. And similar to when indexing, control the segment count by either configuring an index with multiple shards or setting a larger refresh interval. So, as of now, we have covered streaming ingestion and vector store for the demo architecture. I would like to thank you for your time and hand over to Harshida to bring us home. Thank you. Thank you, Thaus. And thank you all so much for joining us today. We'll start off with open search service, and what we are going to focus is on the provisioned aspect. So open search service is a distributed database to enable your search and log analytics use case. For the demo architecture, we consider to use open search to centralize the application logs as well as the logs from the AWS services for operational analytics. So the incoming data is in the JSON format. This is sent to open search service domain where it is indexed. So each and every field is indexed. And then it's available for query. An application can use that query for a search use case or an end user can use it for near real time monitoring alerting, dashboarding to generate operational insights. Now, in order for your workload to get low latency and the high throughput for indexing, as well as have stringent performance when you're querying it, there are a few factors and aspects that come into play. So we'll look at some of those concepts. So first is data is stored in an index. Consider index, which is analogous to a database table. In here, we have an example of a streaming use case or log analytics where we are indexing by every day. And for a search use case, we can use two or more. For simplicity, we are using product catalog as an index. This index are composed of shards. So shards are an instance of Lucene index. So when you create an index, you can define how many shards do you want, the primary shards. In this example, we have five primary shards. So the entire data is then distributed across the primary shards. You can choose to specify a replica of an index. So a replica is a full copy of the corresponding primary index. The shards are then distributed across the nodes, and the shards are what gives you the parallelism for your workload. So shards play an important role. Either you are doing querying or you are doing indexing. Now shard is the actual worker, which is mapped to a CPU. So with open search service, the shard strategy is the core of how your workload you can perform on the open search domain. So to share with you some of the best practices with shard strategy, first is the shard size. For a search use case, it's very stringent in terms of how much amount of data is reading, but also it is very stringent in terms of the performance. So cons consider to have the shard size of 10 to 30 gigabyte. For a log analytics use case, it's very heavy on write. So consider the shard size to be 30 to 50 gigabyte. The second is shard count. So how many shards you are going to have per node? This is very dependent upon two ratios. The first is the JVM heap size or the memory size. 
So consider to have for one gigabyte less than or equal to 25 shards. And the second is the vCPU mapping to the active shard. So have 1.5 vCPU per active shard. And distribute your shard across the data nodes to get the parallelism. Now for a log use case, the volume of the data is very high. But the requirement is the most recent data needs to be frequently accessed and your query performance is very stringent. But as the data gets older, you still need the ability to infrequently access it, where the performance is not as stringent. So how do you do this lifecycle management? So within OpenSearch, there is a feature, Index State Management, where you can define a condition. When this index ages, or the document size is XYZ, it's going to move those indexes to lower tier. So this automates the migration and deletion of the indexes. So the incoming data is in the hot tier. The hot tier is an instance, and it also has elastic block storage, which provides you that throughput requirement for indexing and the performance that you need for querying. When the condition is met by the index, it's pushed down to the ultra warm tier. Ultra warm is also an instance, but the storage is Amazon S3. So what you are trading is performance for cost savings ultimately going to cold storage for archival and then deleting. So to summarize the best practices with open search service, specifically when you are sizing or choosing the instance type for the hot tier, which is the data node, consider AWS Graviton 2 instance type, which provides better price performance. Elastic block storage of GP3, which also provides better price performance. Use reserved instance pricing for additional cost saving and if you have a time series use case, use index state management so you can leverage the tiered storage for additional cost savings. And with any application, it's always, always essential to monitor and then instrument. So now let's start off with to build our data pipeline. We'll start off with the data, which is on Amazon S3, Simple Storage Service, your object store. So how should you lay out your data in order to make your analytical workload performant? From an analytical workload, it could be either data processing or you're running an analytical query directly on the data on S3. A typical analytical workload deals with large volume of data. It could be selecting subset of columns, but it's applying a filter. Say you are applying a date filter. So consider to partition your data on S3 using the most commonly used columns as filter. Convert the data into a columnar format, Parquet or ORC, which further reduces the amount of data scan. Compress the data with a splittable file format, which allows you to run parallelism. And compact your data. So compaction with the file size of 128 to 512 megabyte. Why is all this essential? is when you have an analytical service working with S3, you want to reduce the amount of data which is scanned, reduce the I.O., and hence improve the performance. So these best practices are applicable whether you are doing data processing or you are running analytical query directly on S3. So now we have the data on Amazon S3. Now we need to clean the data, cleanse the data, apply data quality as it is arriving. We want to transform it using the business rule integrate it and make it ready and available for consumption. So over here, we'll focus on two of the services which provides you, Amazon EMR and AWS Glue. We'll start off with AWS Glue. So what we will do in the next section is we'll cover what the service is, what feature it provides, and wrap up with best practices in each of those sections. So AWS Glue is a serverless service. It is fully managed for data integration. When you build data integration, you need the ability to connect to your sources, you need the ability to connect to your targets. AWS Glue supports number of connectors. You can also write your custom connector. You can also use connectors from AWS Marketplace. Open source engine to run your workload or help you build your workload. Data catalog, which is metadata about the data, and as Thas mentioned, data quality to apply within your data ETL pipeline. And from the developer perspective, it provides Glue Studio, Visual Editor. If you like the option of no code, low code, you can drag the connectors and it would generate the script for you. But for developers who like to do their development or hand code, the code, 
It supports Notebook with interactive development environment. And Glue Notebook natively integrates with Code Whisperer, which is the AI coding companion, to significantly enhance developers' productivity. So based on a comment or a prompt in natural language, it would good give recommendation on a snippet of code or full block of code. AWS Code Whisperer also integrates with number of programming languages as well as interactive development environment. So let's take a look at an example. So in this example, this is Glue Notebook using PySpark. The developer writes comments in natural language, create a Spark data frame from JSON file, and write Spark data frame into Redshift. So based on this, Code Whisperer provides in near real time recommendation right within the language that you are working with. So this significantly improves developer productivity. As with any data integration service, you need the ability to monitor, you need the ability to also schedule, so Glue supports that. So Glue data integration, the engine it supports is Python shell, which is a single node. If you want to run Python on a distributed support for Ray, Apache Spark, and when you create an Apache Spark job, you can choose the worker type based on the performance for your workload. And either you can execute in a standard mode or you can execute using flexible execution. So with flexible execution, Glue is going to use the spare capacity, though it provides you cost savings, but only use flexible execution for non-sensitive workload. So to summarize the best practices, Glue, when you create a job, provides you knobs that you can turn, configurations that you can enable. So first, is choose the worker type so it meets the performance and the SLA for your workload. Turn on auto-scaling, so glue based on your workload will auto-scale up and scale down. The default timeout for a glue job is 48 hours, so try to set the glue job timeout. Turn on monitoring, so glue also supports, glue serverless supports Spark UI, and it also provides you observability metrics to look into how your workload is performing so you can fine tune it. If you want to do incremental processing, use job bookmark, which, is, which is, works as checkpointing. Now, as best practices apply when you're configuring the job, those best practices also apply when you're doing your application de development with the lens that you want to reduce the I.O. to make your workload performant. Use pushdown predicate. Before joining large tables, try to minimize the data that you're joining. So this is AWS Glue, serverless service for data integration. And when you want to do big data processing, this is where Amazon EMR comes into picture. Amazon EMR supports number of open source frameworks, Apache Spark, Hive, Presto, Trino, Flink, HBase, and more. It provides different deployment options. Amazon EMR on EC2, where you can completely control the instance type and the number of instances, but you can also choose from number of open source frameworks. If you are using Elastic Kubernetes service and you're running your Spark application, Amazon EMR is supported on EKS. Amazon EMR serverless completely simplifies your experience and management, and if you want Amazon EMR close to your premise, it is supported on AWS Outpost. So the distinction is Amazon EMR on EC2 supports number of open source frameworks, Apache Spark, Flink, HP, Presto, and more. EKS supports, Amazon EMR on EKS supports Apache Spark, and Amazon EMR serverless supports Apache Spark and Hive. From the architecture perspective, for EMR, you have a leader node, and then you have two types of compute. The core nodes, which includes HDFS, that means the data. And the task node, they are only compute. It does not have the data. So when you create an EMR cluster, you can choose from two options. One is the uniform instance group. With uniform instance group, you can choose one instance type, and that instance type could be either on demand or it could be spot. So based on your configuration, that cluster gets created. So if you are either starting with Amazon EMR and want to keep it simple, you can start with Uniform Instance Group. But if you have a very well-defined workload and you want the consistency 
of the amount of re resources, you can use uniform instance group. Instance fleet, you define a core instance fleet and a task instance fleet. And you can choose different instance type. And with API, you can have less than or equal to 30 instance type that you can choose. And both of them can be a mix of on-demand and spot. And it provides you the option for a location strategy that for on-demand, choose the lowest priced instance. And for spot, choose the lowest price, but the high capacity instance types. So consider to use instance fleet. If you have a very complex workload, I'll go back one more slide. If you have a complex workload and you want the ability to turn the knobs for cost optimization or performance. Now the task nodes are the one that does not have data. So consider to use spot instances for your task node. If a, a spot instance gets disrupted, it is replaced by Amazon EMR using an instance in that instance fleet, as well as Spark on Amazon EMR. If the spot, there is an interruption in spot, it handles it gracefully. So task node, spot to reduce the cost, but you also by adding the compute, you get the additional degree of parallelism. Now what about the unpredictable workload? So managed scaling on EMR provides you the ability to automatically scale up and scale down based on your workload. You specify the min and the max capacity or the compute unit, and Amazon EMR is automatically going to handle the scaling up and scaling down to help with your unpredictable workload. EMR supports EMR file system, which allows EMR to read and write directly from Amazon S3. So with this, what it provides you is the ability to have your persistent data on Amazon S3 decouple your storage from compute. So consider if you have one monolithic EMR cluster or a workload where you're running batch interactive queries, you're running data science workload, you now have the ability to do the workload isolation because of the separation of compute and storage and S3 being the persistent data store. So your batch workload, when it starts, it churns the data, does intermediate processing, and writes the persistent data back to Amazon S3, that cluster can be transient in nature. So when the workload is completed, it terminates, so again results into cost savings. You can have heterogeneous different EMR clusters for your use case. They can all be different in size, use different instance type, further providing you cost optimization. So to summarize the best practices for EMR, the key consideration is work backwards from your workload. Choose the right instance type to meet the SLA for your workload. Use Graviton2 instance type. For your unpredictable workload, use managed scaling. Use spot for your task. And always, always monitor an instrument. And EMR supports EC2 savings plan, as well as reserved instance pricing, where you can further reduce the cost. Now with using AWS Glue and EMR, we have the curated data with high quality. Now we want to consume that data using Amazon Redshift. So Amazon Redshift is going to consume this data where we are going to write using Apache Spark connector, but then this data is securely shared to Amazon Redshift data warehouse for consumption. We are doing workload isolation using Amazon Redshift feature data sharing. So let's dive into Amazon Redshift. Amazon Redshift is a fully managed data warehousing service which allows you to run analytics at scale securely. It's massively parallel processing architecture where you can run your query on your data warehouse, but it also allows you to extend your data warehouse to the data on Amazon S3, which is your data lake. The data can be, can be in any open formats, Parquet, ORC, JSON, it also supports table formats such as Hoodie, Delta Lake, Iceberg. So one single query can connect to the data or join the data on your data warehouse to the data sitting on your data lake. You could have different data sources. Data could be arriving in a batch form or data could be arriving in near real time in streaming fashion. Amazon Redshift allows streaming ingestion it natively integrates with services such as Kinesis Data Stream as well as MSK. 
Some of the data sources in a data warehouse could also be from your operational source system or transactional source system. Say, for example, if you're using RDS or Aurora, MySQL, or Postgres, Amazon Redshift provides you a federated query feature where you can directly from Redshift run operational queries on your transactional source. In Adam's keynote, there was an announcement of zero ETL. So with zero ETL integration with Amazon Aurora on your transactional sources, if there is an insert, update, or delete that occurred, Within seconds, that is replicated onto Redshift Managed Storage. So the support for zero ETL, you do not need to do data pipeline. With few clicks, you set the configuration, and the snapshot of your transactional source is available on your data warehouse to run analytics. So zero ETL is supported with Amazon MySQL, which is already generally available. And today in the keynotes, there was announcement to support RDS MySQL, Amazon for Aurora Postgres, as well as DynamoDB, which is a NoSQL database. Now, from a consumption side, end users can use JDBC or ODBC and use products of your choice to run an analytical query. Amazon Redshift also integrates with Amazon SageMaker, where you can create a machine learning model in Redshift using simple SQL. So there are two methods of inference, either local inference, which is on Amazon Redshift, you could also do a remote inference where you have a SageMaker endpoint. In preview today, we have where you have the ability to create Redshift machine model based on the large language models available in Amazon SageMaker Jumpstart. Amazon Redshift provides you separation of compute and storage, so this also opens up the use case for data sharing where you can securely share the data from a one data warehouse to other data warehouse without having to move the data. You can do data sharing within the data warehouse in a single account, across AWS accounts, and across AWS regions. So this provides you to implement data sharing within one account. You can also have deployment patterns such as centralized hub and spoke or data mesh. So to, for the best practices with Redshift, Use RA3 or serverless because both provides you separation of compute and storage. And right size your data warehouse, not only for your ingestion workload, but also for your consumption workload. And if you further want workload isolation, use data sharing so you can separate your write from the reads. For a provision Amazon Redshift, turn on auto scaling or auto, auto WLM. With automatic WLM, it uses machine learning where it provides you the ability to prioritize your high priority workload and throttle down your low priority workload. For your unpredictable workload, turn on concurrency scaling, which is a feature which works as auto scaling. To protect from your runaway queries, apply query monitoring rules to WLM and use reserved instance pricing. For serverless, the compute is known as serverless workgroup. We can start with the base Redshift processing unit and serverless automatically scales up and scales down based on your workload pattern. So if you want your cost to make it predictable and control the scaling, you can set max RPU limit. So this is the data warehouse where the data is available. We securely share it to a data Amazon Redshift consumer, and this is serving as the domain data. But the key thing with generative AI or any data analytics workload or use cases is to centralize the governance and apply access control. Only provide the access that an end user truly needs. So this is where AWS Lake Formation comes into picture, where you can centralize the governance as well as provide fine-grained access control. Lake Formation natively integrates with AWS Glue, so when you're doing the permission management, it is on AWS Glue data catalog. So lake formation, when you're setting the permission, you can use database style permission, but it also supports tag-based access control, and it natively integrates with AWS services. So consider a use case. You have data on S3. It is cataloged by Glue. AWS lake formation is managing the permission. End users could be using any of the analytical services to query it. Each of the service is going to respect the permission that is applied by AWS Lake Formation. 
From the database style permission, you can do grant and revoke, but the permission that you're applying are to the Glue data catalog resources. Database, you can apply permission at the table level, column level, cell level, or at the row level. And the principles could be AWS native IAM user or IAM role, or if you are doing federation through SAML or using AWS IAM identity center, those are the principles. Now with lake formation, it applies or supports tag-based access control. So you can start with a tag ontology. And in this example, we are using the tag class, which is classifying the sensitivity of the data. You create a tag, you assign that tag to a resource. The resource, we are going to start with a database. And with tag, it provides inheritance. So all the tables within database sale are going to inherit the permission but also provides you the flexibility to override that permission, be it at the table level or column level. Now take that tag and then assign it to the principles. So with tag-based access control, one of the best practices with lake formation, to scale the permission management, use LF tags, and also use the latest version of AWS lake formation. So let's take a look at an example where we have four individuals, we have four resources, and we want to apply the permission. So we'll have to do 16 times, and when we have the fifth resource, we have to continue applying the permission, the total of 20. Versus, let's take exactly the same scenario, where we are using the LF tag approach, where we are going to assign the tags to the resources and assign the tag to the individual so they get the permission. When you have a fifth resource, all you have to do is just assign the tag. So this permission model with lake formation not only extends to the principal, but you can also do across accounts. For da this enables data sharing. So in this example, we have a producer account and we have a consumer account. What we want to do is data sharing. We are only sharing the metadata. We are not going to move the data from one account to the other account. So the producer grants usage to the consumer account Lake Formation provides that shared resources on the consumer side, and the consumer is going to create resource links. So those shared resources are available in the Glue Data Catalog on the consumer side, and then assign the permission to the principals. So when any user is going to query that shared resources through Glue Catalog, it's going to be seamless to them. So with this simplicity of how you can do data sharing, it enables you to do single account, hub and spoke, data mesh, as well as business to business patterns. So to summarize, data is the key differentiator for Gen AI. It not only calls for, I'm gonna build up the slide, it not only calls for the best practices or the conventional best practices with data analytics pipeline, but it also surfaces some of the use cases that we have not seen historically with data. One is the glue, use of glue, or sorry, one is the use of vector database, specifically in the semantic search and context. Vector database itself is not a new technology, but Gen AI makes it mainstream in the data pipeline. Unstructured data has surpassed the structured data, both in volume, velocity, and variety. But now, with structured data, we apply the diligence with Gen AI, it would also equally require to apply the same diligence on unstructured data. Gen AI is touching wide user base based on the use cases. So mapping the unstructured data with wide user persona, what it becomes essential is the implementation of privacy, security, and compliance. And lastly, having high data quality, a comprehensive data strategy where you're unifying, breaking the data silos, and applying central governance. So that is the key foundation for generative AI applications. I'm going to pause here for 30 seconds. These are all the QR codes that we have ref referenced throughout the blog, written by our specialists. They, are, they do get updated if the information changes, so please take a note of this. Okay. All right, everybody good? Perfect. So congratulations.
you have completed one more session for Wire Weaver, so you're more close to your target. So we really, Taz and I, we really appreciate you taking the time. Thank you so much for your time, and please fill out the session survey. Taz and myself will be available here to take the questions. Thank you all so much. <laughs>